Welcome to The Scientist Speaks, a podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team. Our podcast is by scientists and for scientists. Once a month, we'll bring you the stories behind newsworthy molecular biology research. In this month's episode, we learn that human brains differentiate pitch in a way that macaque monkeys do not. In fact, speech and music shape the human brain's hearing circuits. Researchers are studying these circuits with an eye on developing treatments for neurological disorders. Catherine Loidel from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Bevel Conway, an investigator in the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to learn more. Neuroscientist Bevel Conway's research focuses on searching for differences in the ways that human and monkey brains process sight. His brain mapping studies suggest that humans and monkeys see the world similarly. In 2014, Conway got speaking to colleagues Josh McDermott and Sam Norman Hager about a functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, technique for investigating human hearing. With this method, McDermott and Norman Hager identified the region in the human brain that selectively responds to pitched sounds. We can think of, at a very coarse level, sounds as either being noise, that is their broadband in spectrum, in a spectrogram, or they have pitch, they have periodic structure. And so they discovered that there were, you know, that the human brain was very sensitive, responded very strongly to sounds that have pitch, that have this periodic structure in them. Uh, And that's really interesting because we use pitch uh, in a lot of ways in which we communicate with each other using sound. Pitch is obviously very important for music, uh, and we see pitch in the animal kingdom, and macaque monkeys seem to have vocalizations that exploit pitch or can be characterized in their pitch structure, uh, and that's true for a number of different primates. So this was a really cool finding where they discovered that the human brain seemed to be responding more strongly to sounds with pitch than than sort of spectrally matched sounds that didn't have pitch that were noise. Conway wondered if human and monkey brains processed sound differently and teamed up with McDermott and Norman Hagner to find out. Based on his vision studies, Conway was sceptical that they would find significant variance between the species. But over time, the researchers found a certain region of the human brain that has a stronger preference for sounds with pitch than macaque monkey brains do. At beer hour or tea hour, we'd sort of discuss these ideas in in speculative terms, and then it became increasingly more concrete, really motivated in part by a kind of bet that, that Sam and I had, which was the pitch bias regions that they had discovered in humans are located in primary sensory cortex. So these are parts of the human brain that are really wired up for sound, for perceiving sound. And for all intents and purposes, all of the primary sensory cortical areas, so the the parts of the human brain that respond primarily to sound and those that respond primarily to vision, those that respond primarily to touch and the body plan and so on, All of those cortical areas have a kind of map within them, and those maps look very similar in macaque monkeys and in humans. In the 1990s, MIT neuroscientist Nancy Kamwisher discovered discrete, reproducible hotspots in the human brain that respond selectively to faces. Her work relied on MRI techniques for measuring blood flow in the brain. For reasons not currently understood, active neurons recruit more blood. Scientists can use this change in blood flow as a proxy measure of neural activity. With this approach, Kamwisher established that patches of higher cerebral cortex are involved in specific, adapted functions, advancing the idea that the brain is similar to a collection of tools that humans deploy for different tasks. Using Kamwisher's research tools, Norman Hagner explored the auditory system in humans using MRI to measure changes in blood flow which allowed him to watch human brain responses to different kinds of sounds. Performing the same experiments with macaques, however, was more complex. We just trained the animals to 
jump into the scanner. You know, they sat in a specialized chair. They were trained to jump into the chair using the same kind of tricks that you can use to train a dog to, you know, come to you for or shake your hand and so on. So we use these um, positive reinforcement tricks to train the monkeys to jump into the chair, we give them a little grape and so on, and then train them to keep their heads relatively still. And we ran these experiments while we uh, presented these auditory um, stimuli. And we presented the auditory stimuli actually using the identical um, earphones that we used in the humans. We cleaned them off, obviously, and had different attachments for the monkeys. The team recognised the pitch bias in the human brain in almost every human they tested over dozens of experiments. To Conway, the findings seem similar to canonical, strong, organisational features that researchers see in cortical areas for the human visual system. In the first experiment, the team presented macaques with the same synthesised sounds presented to the humans. The sounds were played with pitch or without pitch to the macaques inside the MRI machine. How do you measure responses to these carefully calibrated sounds that do or don't have pitch when that machine is making such a darn racket? And the answer is a very clever trick which is takes advantage of the fact that the signal that we're measuring is sluggish, is, has a slow time course. Um, so we can present the sound while the machine is turned off and then turn the machine on after we've presented the sound and the brain responses we then measure, that is the blood flow we measure, uh, is correlated with the sound that was presented when the scanner was off. We do that a whole bunch of times and average the responses over and over and over again and then get a picture of the average pattern of brain activity caused by the different kinds of stimuli. And that all requires an extensive amount of analysis after the experiment is run um, to, you know, make sure that we don't have artifacts in the data and correct for motion in the data because the monkeys aren't perfectly still. And we um, do all the right statistical tests to make sure that we aren't recovering a kind of false positive because there are lots of numbers involved. And so if you collect many, many, many trials over many voxels in the brain, the chance that you'll find something that looks like it's significant just by chance goes up. And so you've got to be careful to do the statistics in the right way, um, which we did. Amazingly, the researchers saw no pitch bias in the monkeys' brains at all. Although the monkeys strongly responded to both types of sounds, and the team saw maps where the cortex responded differently depending on the frequency, the maps existed for sounds with or without pitch. This led the team to reconsider the experimental design. They wondered if the monkeys had been confused by the synthesised sounds. Humans hear synthetic sounds all of the time from computers, phones, sirens and other sources. But monkeys are less familiar with these sounds. McDermott and Norman Hagner designed a clever second experiment using recorded macaque vocalisations run through an algorithm that extracts the pitch component from the noise component. The team ended up with several ecologically relevant macaque sounds with pitch and without pitch that they played to both humans and monkeys in MRI machines. We saw a little bit of a a greater response to pitch than we found with the synthesized calls consistent with the idea that that the monkeys are more familiar with these sounds but there was no pitch bias the the if you know if anything the monkeys were showing again a strong response to the the noise versions of the macaque calls the humans meanwhile continue to show a whoppingly stronger response to the pitched versions of the monkey calls. These are things, sounds that most humans and certainly our participants had never heard before. So they're very unfamiliar with them. And nonetheless, they're showing a very strong bias for the pitched versions of the calls. 
So that tells us that the pitch bias in humans isn't dependent on familiarity or attention or something related to, you know, how how well you know these these sounds. And conversely, uh, the lack of pitch bias in the monkeys can't be recovered by using sounds that the monkeys are more familiar with. The experiments showed for the first time that substantial species differences between humans and monkeys exist in the organisation of the primary sensory cortex, the stage that first handles sense information. This highlights the fact that brain mechanisms have adapted to particular selective pressures for each species. In terms of the, the auditory result, it does lend support to this idea that uh, you know, pitch is a very important aspect of human communication and, and our brains are adapted to exploit that pitch information. And it raises this question, well, maybe the macaque monkey doesn't use pitch information in the same way humans do. Maybe their vocalizations sound to us to have pitch structure, but that's actually not a relevant dimension in their communication. And it turns out we know very, very little about what aspects of the sounds that they make are actually the relevant dimension for their behavior. When the study first was published, news media reported that the human brain is uniquely wired to appreciate pitch. However, Conway's experiments compared human brains to only one species of monkey. While this has not been shown yet, it raises the question of if pitch appreciation is a unique human trait. Conway and his team plan to look at pitch perception in other primate species, such as marmosets, a new world species of monkey with a richer vocalization structure, behavior, and a bigger repertoire of vocal calls than macaques. The team expects to see more pitch bias in marmosets and brain mechanisms adapted to encoding pitch information, because their behaviors clearly exploit pitch information to a greater extent than macaques. McDermott and Norman Hagia also focus on amusia, which essentially renders a person tone-deaf or pitch-deaf. People suffering from amusia commonly have communication issues, especially in parts of the world where tonal languages are spoken. They may also find music unpleasant and have problems with spatial processing. By studying their brain structures, McDermott and Norman Hager hope to figure out how people with amusia respond to sensory stimuli. Preliminary results indicate that amusic brains are still more sensitive to sounds with pitch, suggesting that scientists might exploit this preserved brain function to recover communication and enable people suffering from amusia to better function within their communities. Conway has returned mainly to his vision research using lessons learned from the auditory work to influence his experimental design. He and his team are running a number of experiments looking at color processing in the brain. The macaque is a useful model because its photoreceptors are almost identical to those in humans. Thank you for listening to The Scientist Speaks. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist and narrated by Catherine Loidel. Please join us next month as we explore how scientists leverage evolution studies to discover new cancer drugs. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. 